Okay, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I guess maybe before I do, how are you guys doing? We're okay. We survive. We're doing okay. Surviving our homework assignments. Is that all right? They're they're tough. They they are okay. That's uh, uh, the intent and the hope is that they they help you learn. They they by forcing you to do hard things. The hope is that you're learning something uh, by doing it. Right? You disagree, or you have a question, comment? Man, I feel like the best way to learn is to like have homework and then come talk to the professors. But given the way that the homework is being time structured, it's very difficult to do that effectively, which is fine, I guess, the in time, terms of... The time of the homeworks? Uh, so, I mean, so I release the homeworks, I guess, on Monday, and I ask for them to be due back the following Monday. So, um, you know, you're, you're always welcome to come talk to me uh, uh, wherever, you know, uh, all right, the I'll time being. I'll come but, yeah. to your house then if you need it. Uh, not in my house, though. No, okay. All right. Um, I'll take the bus. I'll take the same so, bus route. So, um, all right. Uh, well, I'll uh, I'll take that into consideration regarding um, the assignments. I know that I know they're tough, and uh, and it's good for you to have questions and whatnot. Um, we have a holiday on Monday. So we're not going to be meeting uh, in class, which significantly reduces uh, my lecture time, right? So, um, so we have today's lecture, and then we have so this today's Wednesday of fourth week, and then we will, our next lecture will be Wednesday of fifth week, and then we have Monday of sixth week, and then the final exam is Wednesday of sixth week. Okay, so we got three lectures and then a, and a final. So it, it, it's going to go by really quick, okay? So, um, so I looked at all of the stuff that I want to talk about, and, uh, and I looked at our calendar. And so I'm going to have to um, just do some very light treatment of certain topics. Um, and, and we'll, you know, rewrite the tests accordingly. Uh, and so, you know, today um, we'll talk about support vector machines, okay? Support vector machines, SVM. I don't know if you guys have heard of this idea or whatnot, um, but they exist. They're popular, uh, and they're quite powerful given uh, certain kind of modifications and, uh, and whatnot. Um, but uh, I guess in our course, I'm going to just have to cover it at kind of a high-level what they kind of do um, without really getting into the details of the calculations and, and stuff. So I'll, I'll flash a few slides up. Um, it's covered in the homework, but I think the, the extent of support vector machines in the homework um, is fairly light uh, as well. So um, uh, we should cover you know, just enough to get you, get you through the homework, yeah. You need a question there? Oh, you piqued my curiosity. What's the SVM? Can we talk about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk exactly about that. It's called right. the uh, support vector machine. They come up with such a cool name, right? Support vector. I, um, I guess uh, it's basically draw a boundary, OK? Draw, draw a boundary to separate classes. Um, and so um, the idea with these classification algorithms uh, you know, KNN and and uh, and all of these other things. We're assuming we've got numeric inputs and we've got a categorical output. Okay, uh, they don't work as well for categorical inputs. Okay, a lot of these things don't work as well on categorical inputs. They, categorical inputs are, are a little bit trickier. You can do some stuff, but uh, these these perform best when your inputs are numeric. Yeah. Well, I mean, what would it be like a categorical input? Like, I guess you have so like... so a categorical input would be something like <laughs> the input. Like, we want to predict your political party based on your gender or something like okay. that. Okay, and and it's it's just not going to be that great, right? Because uh, you're 
your broad classification is going to be um, probably most females will vote Democratic and most males will vote Republican. That's like, but that's like a terrible <laughs> um, classification rule. I mean, but you know, it's it's, and that's but the only reason why the rule is that is because it's you know over fifty one percent of female will vote vote Democrat and over fifty one percent of males vote Republican if you look at the overall large population or something like that, if, if you only give them the choice between Democrats and Republicans. But of course, this is not an ideal classification method. And so, so if you have something a little bit more nuanced, okay, where you've got a continuous spectrum, things like that, where you take into account things like uh, income and number of years of education and all of these other numeric inputs, you can get uh, finer tuning in terms of uh, you know, how do we predict uh, stuff like that, but uh, but that's that's that, okay? So, um, but anyway, um, we're all kind of dealing with numeric inputs, yeah. All right. So is F SVM a way of compensating for not having those inputs or no, a way no, of calculating it, those inputs? No, all of these, I'm just saying all of these uh, inputs are we're gonna assume are numeric, okay? Including SVM, okay. But you know, K and N again. Uh, so when we do K nearest neighbors and we're talking about Euclidean distance, the idea is that it exists in a x y coordinate plane or you know some kind of coordinate plane where you've got numeric inputs, right? If you had categorical inputs, uh, it becomes really difficult to plot, okay? Because you might be tempted if you got categorical to plot. Uh, yeses as one and noes as zero. Okay, that kind of makes sense for a lot of cases. But do we treat all the yeses and noes equally as ones and zeros? Like, uh, do we say, okay, female is one, male is zero. Uh, and then do we say uh, black hair is one and not black hair is zero? And um, I don't know, you know. Bl blonde hair is one and blonde hair is zero for like different different categorical things and the question is is does it really you know does it make sense to code everything as ones and zeros like our mate if we do that then every single one of these categorical variables are equally uh, weighted and the distances are equally so it it's hard trying to do classification using only categorical inputs is is hard um, and, and there's discussion on how you measure stuff. But we're not going to get into that. We're just, again, assuming we've got numeric inputs, and we're going to do a categorical thing. So OK, so here I've got, uh, what is the dimension of my input space? 2D, right? I've got an x1 and an x2, and so I'm able to just plot it in 2D, right? So we've got this. And then my output, the categories, there's two. There's blue and red. Okay, or blue is positive and red is negative. Okay. And the question is, is can we draw um, a straight line that divides the two classes? Okay, and in this case, I think we can all visualize a straight line being drawn. Okay, um, and there's actually a bunch of straight lines that can be drawn. Okay, so, so I could draw um, a straight line like this, and that will divide blue and red, okay? Um, I could draw a straight line like this. And so, so uh, the circled points, the circles represent the points that are closest to this boundary, okay? So if I draw the straight line like that, okay, then, um, then that blue plus at the top and the red minus down there are the closest points and, and we have what we call the margin. The margin is how close any of my training data points are to this boundary. Okay, so here's one possible boundary that I could draw that uh, successfully splits our plot into uh, blue and red. Okay, and this also works and this also works and this also works. So all of these, these are all different possible things. Okay, if I draw uh, this one, then uh, these two points here and here are both equal Equal distant, equidistant from the boundary, okay, and uh, and if I come here, then then these two and and things like this, okay, and so the uh, the question is which boundary is best? 
what do you think the boundary we should use should be? Well, just just intuitively, what do you think is the best boundary? Yeah. I think it's one of the diagonal ones that only has two circles. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, maybe. Um, so, what actually is decided is that the best boundary is if we measure how wide this is, we call this the margin, the best boundary, someone might say, is the one with the widest margin, okay? So this, um, I guess the most basic form of the support vector machine is called the maximum margin classifier, all right? I don't even know if it's worth writing that up there, but this, this might be known as the maximum margin classifier. And it says that, you know, the margin of basically this thing is wider than any of these margins. So this is a better boundary than, than these ones, okay? So what does margin mean again? The margin is, so the margin is defined by the dot, the distance from the dot uh, to, the, to the, the, technically it's the, if you imagine this as a street, okay? The margin is the width from this dotted line to this dotted line. Right. And we define that by um, picking the, the points that are closest to your boundary. And the boundary kind of goes, goes in the middle. OK? All right, and so um, this, is, this is what we got. There's math involved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the math, OK? Uh, if it interests you, you can look in the textbook under chapter uh, six, chapter five. I mean, chapter five, and read read up on this um, on page one hundred eighty nine in the textbook. Okay, um, and even then. You know, so they all have all this math written on page 189 of the textbook. And even then, they just come to the conclusion, um, now it becomes a computational uh, quadratic optimization problem, OK, or quadratic programming problem, which uh, I actually don't even know how that works. But um, so anyway, here's your basic support vector machine, OK? You've got red dots on one side, blue dots on the other side. And you want to draw a straight line somewhere so that the margin or the width of the street is as wide as possible. Okay, and so this is no good, and this one down here is no good, but this one okay. is the best because this is the widest street that we can get. Okay. Is that all right? So that's just the the most basic form of this. Okay. And I think uh, I think this is what it right. SVM says the best line is to pick the one that maximizes the margin. The margin is defined as the perpendicular distance from the decision boundary to the closest points on either side, uh, and these are the support vectors. So this is the one because this is the margin, maximum margin. Okay, and then these dots that are on the boundary, these are known as the support vectors because technically. These are the only three points in the data set that define this, OK? I could move this data point and move it way over here, or move it over here, or move it over here, and the margin is going to remain unchanged, OK? And I can move any of these um, red dots and move them around, and the margin, maximum margin, is, is also going to remain unchanged. And so, um, so these become known as the support vectors because these are the data points, OK? Uh, and, and they're called vectors because they might exist in higher dimensional space, not just two dimensional space, which I've got plotted here, right? So, so if you've got like 17 dimensional data, uh, like I can't plot it, but, but the idea still exists that there's some uh, hyperplane that we might, uh, a linear hyperplane that cuts through it. So, uh, so, so in 2D, I can draw a line to divide it. Now, if you imagine a cloud of red points in three-dimensional space and a cloud of blue points in three-dimensional space, then my boundary is a, a basically a flat sheet, a plane in three-dimensional <clears throat> space. And then we can't really picture four-dimensional or higher-dimensional space, but then you just have the equivalent of a linear boundary, which we call a hyperplane. Yeah. 
So I guess you're going to get to it eventually. Like this is like a very nice graph. But what do we? What about when you have like a point stuck behind enemy lines? Yeah. Okay. So what do you? What do we do? Then yeah, that that presents a problem, right? So okay. So this was just the uh, ideal scenario where you have what we call a linear. Li the classes are linearly separable. Okay. That we can just draw a nice straight line and say, ah, all the blue points end up on this side and all the red points end up on that side. Okay, and that's like our ideal scenario. And we like that, right? That, that keeps it easy. Um, I think I've labeled all this stuff here. Okay. Um, all right, we're, so I guess I'll delete all of this. So you can skip no. all the math, okay? No, right. <laughs> so we're not gonna bother with any of the math, all right? And I hope, I hope nobody's uh, too heartbroken about that, okay? So we're gonna skip the math. You're not going to be tested on the math. That's all you really want to hear, right? You don't want, you're not going to be tested on this. No, I um, prefer being tested on math. Um, on the support vector <clears throat> math. Okay. So this is what we what we got, and I labeled all the. Okay, so we're going to skip all of this math stuff. Um, no, okay. I guess. All right. Well, we're not going to bother with that. Okay. So yeah, what do we do if we've got a data point? that uh, doesn't work as nicely, right? So what do we do? Okay, so in that case, we have to go with what's called a soft margin. Um, soft margin support vector machine classifier, okay? So I'm gonna just kinda copy this and we'll put it in here. Sniping tool's moving, oh no, what am I gonna do? Um, That's for stats 10. Don't you guys miss stats 10? No? Okay, so you know, in this case, we've got nice linear separation we can draw. Uh, oh gosh, it's really hard. It's really hard to draw on this. Okay, we can draw something like that, okay? All right, what do I do if I'm gonna just stick in, where did my um, color palette go? Here it is, okay. All right, so what if I have a red point right there, okay? And what if I bring it in, if I bring in a dot right here, okay? Then my boundary, what is my boundary gonna be? I mean, you could put it the My, my that. boundary has to be something like this now, right? Okay, uh, I, I guess I can do any of these things, but, but probably, uh, I'm not quite sure what the best. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's going to actually um, be defined like if this is the dot here and this is the dot here, uh, the margin is defined by the, the distance between this and this, the centers of these points there. Okay? So so that's, that's the margin. The margin is quite tiny. How do I... Uh, I don't know how to draw a dotted line. Okay. So you're gonna get you know, a dotted line. I'll just draw, draw something like this, okay? All right, so this is, now our margin isn't that great, okay? Uh, and so, so we say, well, maybe, maybe it's okay if we misclassify. We're gonna just say, you know, I want, I want the, I want the street wide. I don't like my street being so narrow. I don't want my margin to be so small. Okay, and we say, well, I really want a wide street. And you know what? This rule that the street can never misclassify is too restrictive. Okay, I can say something like that. Right? This having to make sure that the street never misclassifies anything is too restrictive. And sometimes it might not even be possible. Right? If I get a red dot over here in the middle, then I can't even draw a street. What am I supposed to do in that case, okay? So, so we say, um, so we're gonna say, you know what? Let's still draw this, okay? And, and we're gonna, you know, my margin, you know, my street looks like this. That's a nice, 
Okay, all right. Okay, Th this sucks. But my so my drawing's not that great. But the idea is I've got a wider street, right? Okay. So I got what I wanted. I wanted a wide street. I got a wide street. And what was the cost? The cost was I misclassified a point. Okay. And um, and so uh, the support vector machine. Okay, this support vector classifier has an argument that says, you know what, we will allow for misclassifications and we are just going to assign a penalty for your misclassification, okay? And basically, uh, you can have as wide of a street as you want and you can even misclassify stuff and you just need to tell me how much of a penalty you're willing to pay for each misclassified point, okay? And so, um, so we can get different we can get different uh, boundaries here, right? And and the goal in the big case is we still we just we want to be able to classify stuff, and we don't want to overfit, okay? And so, so the idea is you know if I have a red dot here, maybe this is overfitting. Maybe this is just a weird data point. Maybe the the true boundary looks more like this diagonal line and not this vertical one. And this red point is just a weird thing that showed up in my data. And so maybe I don't want to draw my decision boundary based on this point alone, but just say, you know what, let's keep it diagonal. And, uh, and I'll just pay a little penalty for misclassifying this point in my data. Okay? And so uh, I'm going to just, again, kind of skipping all of the math, let's just take a look at what the SVM classifier looks like in R, okay? So uh, I got to do library E1071, okay? And then we'll ask what SVM does. Can we read this? Oh, you guys can't see that. Okay, so SVM, you've got X, which is the input data matrix, and Y, which is your current classifications for the training data. All right. So, so for here, we're going to look at we're going to look at this. Okay. So your uh, to train the model to create a SVM model in R you provide it the training data. The X, which is this numeric matrix, columns of numeric data, okay? So if I were to put this into uh, my thing, what are my, what's the dimensions of X? My input matrix. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I got 17 data points. So what is my input X matrix? 17 by 2, okay? X, there's two dimensions, right? There's X1 and X2, and I've got 17 data points. So I've got, so my training data for X is 17 by 2, okay? So X, I've got 17 data points, so I'm going to have 17 rows. I've got X1 and X2, I've got two columns. So X is 17 by 2, and then what is the dimensions of Y? Y is our labels. Okay, and so that's just one dimensional, but I've got 17, so it's going to be a vector of set length 17. Okay, so y is a vector of length 17. Does that make sense? And it's going to say either you know class one or class two. Okay, so that's what we put in, and then um, we've got a few different arguments here. Okay, you've got uh, a scale whether the data should be scaled, and we kind of that was on your midterm whether you should scale your data or not, um, and then we've got type. Um, which um, right now is just, you can just leave it as um, uh, blank or something, okay? And then we've got a kernel, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but right now I guess we'll stick with the linear where we're drawing a straight line thing. And then one of these functions is the cost, cost of constraints violation, okay? And this is basically how much of a penalty you have for allowing a data point to end up on the wrong side 
of the boundary. Okay, and so if you keep if the cost is low, then your classifier, you know, it doesn't want to misclassify things, but it's okay with it. Okay, if you put a high cost though, it's going to move the boundary to really avoid misclassifying any data point. Right, so so it's kind of just like saying, um, you know. Uh, you'll get more money if you have a wide street. All right, so we want as wide of a street as possible, right? But then you've got to pay a fine for every misclassified point. Okay, so you got so if the fine is a hundred bucks, maybe you're like, okay, well, it's better to have the wide street. I'll pay the fine. But but if the fine is like a million dollars for a misclassified point, you're gonna say, okay, even just having one misclassified point is gonna ruin the project for me. So I'm gonna have a super narrow street, but at least I won't have misclassified anything, and I'll just take my small profits and go okay so that's what we got here okay cost is going to be um, the, the width of uh, how much penalty gets applied from this classifying a point okay um, so that's what we have there okay um, all right and that allows us to still be able to draw um, boundaries where you've got points on the wrong side. The uh, the other aspect, I guess I'll say this. Sure. Um, okay, so we got this, and so you know, we can even have misclassified points, and you know. If if I put a if I put a data point in here again, if we said you cannot misclassify anything, then I can't draw a street at all, right? Because there's no way I can draw a linear boundary that will not misclassify anything. It's just not possible. So so now we have to say, well, just allow me to misclassify a point, and uh, and I'll I'll pay the penalty. Okay, so th then we can do that. Um, there might be other situations, okay, where uh, a linear boundary just isn't isn't going to do the trick, okay? Um, and so, what do we do in situations like that, okay? Uh, you know what? Let's let's just open up part of your homework assignment here. I didn't, I didn't want to do this, but um, let's just take a look. Not the solutions. Is this what I posted? Okay. Something like this. I think the solutions too. Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that again. So I think all of these, the I think this is all you have to do. Um, where? All right. So here's our data. Okay. This is what our data looked like. Okay. Uh, we've got red points and black points. And we want to be able to draw some kind of boundary to separate the red and the black points, right? And so we go, we look at this and we go, what? This is not possible, right? We try to draw a straight line, it's going to suck, OK? And so we say, well, maybe maybe I can draw a curved line, OK? That sounds like a forbidden technique. Yeah, so how do we go about drawing a curved line? Well, this is this is tricky, OK? And so we use something called the kernel trick okay and so let me let me before i do this let's just go to a simple simpler problem okay why is it so hard to draw straight lines okay what if this is my data here okay i've got i'm going to have a uh, You have points like this, okay? And then we're gonna have some points, okay? And I say draw some kind of boundary to separate red from blue, okay? Now, obviously, a straight line is not gonna work, okay? Straight line, I'm gonna, I just, I can't do it, right? I'm gonna have, I can draw like this, or, it, yeah, I. A straight line's not going to work, right? We want, like, if we're going to draw a boundary, it's going to look something like inside here is red and outside is blue, okay? This is kind of 
This is kind of what would make sense to us for a boundary. Okay, so how do we do something like this? Well, the kernel trick says, all right, you've got data points, like this point, maybe this point is uh, 1 comma 1, and this point is uh, 8 comma 8, all right? And this point is maybe uh, 1 comma negative 1, and this one is 8 comma negative 8. And what the kernel trick does It says, we are going to project my two-dimensional data into a higher dimension. Okay, So I'm going to just go from 2D to 3D, which is about the simplest we can deal with. Okay, But the kernels can actually go from 2D into like 10D, 2D into like infinite dimensional space, Okay, which, which I cannot visualize for you. Okay, but, but basically, I can do something like, um, if we have a point x, y, I'm going to project it into the space x, y, and x squared plus y squared, or something like that. Okay, so I can do that. All right, and so my point will go from one one to one one uh, two, and then this point eight eight. We'll go to uh, 8, 8, 128, OK? All right, and then so basically, uh, if I do that uh, in 3D space, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to do this now. <laughs> OK, but, um, but, but visually, all right, so I'm going to have basically uh, four points down here, and then, um, and then now I've got uh, in higher dimensional space, something like this, okay? Uh, I, I don't know. The, the four points are up high up high up here, and then the, the points down below are, are down here, okay? And now I can draw um, a plane in this uh, that that will separate the red from the blue points, okay? And then, uh, and so if I draw the plane here, then I can project that plane back into 2D space if I wanted to, and it would look um, it would look something like this, okay? So you can imagine um, the this kernel, what it what it's doing is basically it's projecting the data onto this kind of paraboloid shape, okay? And then so therefore my hyperplane, which separates the red from the blue, ends up looking like this uh, circle. Does that kind of make sense? Um, I want to decide. Um, OK, so the reason why we call this a kernel, the kernel trick, is that um, it's it, it's actually, it can be expressed as an inner product. Yeah, you want to So do you like take the boundary that you generated and then project it back downwards? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, uh, I guess, what we're doing. But the truth is, is we don't even bother projecting it into the high dimensional space. Like I'm doing this as a as an aid, a visual aid to understand what's happening, okay? But mathematically, or like computationally, when the computer does this, um, it does not bother projecting it into the higher dimensional space and figuring out the boundary there, okay? It's equivalent to doing this, okay? It's equivalent to doing this. And this is something that I think we can visualize and kind of understand. But mathematically, what it's doing is it's just calculating an inner product, uh, which we call the kernel function, OK? And so, um, um, so, so I, I think uh, the kernel function between um, basically the vector x and the vector y, in this case, is, uh, now i got to look this up on Wikipedia. <laughs> is this related to the algebra, like linear algebra kernel? No, it's it's 
you know, we use kernels for all sorts of things. Facts, facts. And, uh, and so it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's just like the letter P. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, polymorphic. I have no internet. What's up with that? Just use the same Wi-Fi for you. Okay. You see my Wi-Fi? I know. I always forget how to do this. Okay. Do I have to enter my password? As one of them yes. does, asks you to, and one of them that doesn't. Web doesn't. Wi-Fi does. That's okay. All right. Let's just look up kernel trick. All right. Well, I must have already been logged in. Okay, so I think here's the picture. So this is kind of a the uh, the idea here, and here is um, um, so you can express things as using a kernel function. So if we project x one and x two into this higher dimensional space which is x1, x2, and x1 squared plus x2 squared, it's equivalent to writing a kernel function, okay, which it re uses these, uh, calculates this um, product here, okay? And uh, again, I'm going to kind of skip a lot of these math details, and um, uh, here's a visualization after we watch this advertisement. Okay, and so here is a polynomial kernel, again, where we're just going from 2D to 3D space, and it's hard to see, but there's blue points and red points, and the blue points and red points get projected into three-dimensional space, like this, and when they're projected in three-dimensional space like this, we can draw a plane that will separate the blue and the red classes. Okay, we can draw a linear boundary. Okay, a linear boundary here, and that when it gets projected back down into two-dimensional data, which is what we have, it creates uh, a boundary that separates the blue and the red. Okay. Um, is that okay? Should I just play that again? It's just kind of neat to see. All right. So here's our here's our data in two D. We cannot separate the red and the blue traditionally with a line, a linear boundary. We project it into higher dimensional space. We draw a boundary, a linear boundary, which is in 3D space is a plane. So we draw a plane that separates the blue from the red. And then when it gets projected down, it looks like a circle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but why can we just use the, this circle in the 2D plan to add the boundary? Yeah, why don't we just use a circle? Oh, like the oval. I mean, because we have just add the the uh, the product of like yeah. x, y, yeah. y. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, so in these silly examples, it's nice. Okay, we can draw a nice little circle, and we can just say find the best uh, ellipse or circle or something, uh, you know, best quadratic uh, thing. Um, it's uh, you know, again, we skipped all the computation. Okay, and so the computation for figuring out a linear boundary has been solved, whether it's in 1D or 2D or you know higher dimensional space. So we can say, all right, this is how we pick the linear boundary um, to separate things to get the maximum thing. Um, finding uh, the circle or the ellipse or something like that or weird curvy line um, is not easy to do. And so, uh, so from a computational standpoint, it's easy to find the plane or the hyperplane. And so computationally, uh, again, it's also going to be easier to deal with this kind of hidden higher dimensional projection. Now, we don't actually even have to project it to the higher dimensional space. Uh, we show this because that's what it's equivalent to do being done. but. As far as the computation goes, it just uses this um, kernel function here. Okay, it just uses this k function, this kernel function, and again, you know, maybe we're, 
for simplicity, we're, you know, we're, we're missing out a little bit on what's going on here, okay? Um, so, so, so we're not, we're, computationally, we're not even projecting it into the higher dimensional space, okay? But when we calculate, we use the same rules of finding a maximum margin classifier, but we use, rather than um, just the inner product of x and y directly, we are using this kernel function. And when we do that, it's equivalent to projecting it into the higher dimensional space and finding it. Um, and so what we do is when we run the inner product and we use the kernel, okay, and we have a choice of kernel, then generally the linear kernel is just you take x and x transpose y or u, u transpose v and you take it. And that, that will keep it in the linear space. But you can do all of these things and probably the most popular one is the radial basis kernel, okay, which takes uh, basically the norm of u minus v, okay, and it uh, raises it, it takes uh, e to, raised to that power. Um, so the kernel function is equivalent to having the inner product of the higher dimensional space. So, so this is like you transform x into the higher dimensional space using phi. And uh, so this is the 2D point projected into 3D, and you take the inner product. And now whenever you have the inner product of two vectors of the same length, the result is what? A scalar, OK? So we're just getting a scalar, OK? And so um, so anyway, we, we do this. We get a scalar. and um, and probably the most co popular kernel is the radial basis function kernel, which is just you take the two vectors, x and y, or u and v, or here x and x prime, whatever we want to call it, OK? You take your two points, and then this is the kernel. This is going to return a scalar, OK? It is technically equal to the inner product of a phi transformation. The phi transformation for this radial basis function exists in infinite dimensional space. It it takes the it's the Taylor expansion of the exponent function. Okay, so the e function you can do a Taylor expansion which goes out to infinity and you're doing an inner product there. Okay, uh, and so hang on a second, um, uh, and that's what it does. So we're not even going to bother trying to figure out the what this point x is in infinite dimensional space. That's it's not even possible to compute, but we don't have to. We just use the kernel function, and it and it does the math for us. Yeah, question. Well, actually, I have three questions. But the first one is, isn't that like oddly similar to like the some stuff you see in like the normal or whatever? Yeah. It is. So this is the radial basis function is also called the Gaussian kernel because it looks a lot like the normal function. All right. But just... but basically, the idea is that this this result could be theoretically expressed as the inner product of two vectors, okay? Right. It's just the inner product of two infinitely long vectors, okay? All right, keep going. I keep seeing, like, length squared. But isn't length already squared? Is that just a notational thing? Uh, the, this is the uh, squared length, the squared length. So it's, like, it's the hypotenuse before you take the square root of it. But like, doesn't norm usually imply squaring? Like, doesn't double lines usually imply squaring? Uh, it, no, in most notation, the double line is the square root. The uh, It's the length of the hypotenuse. And then by, having, uh, third, by here, it's the, the square. Third question. Yeah. Is it always a circle? And how does this really No, it's not always a circle. Okay. Yeah, it seems like with the... It, with, yeah. with, in in with, our thing, when we graphed it, because we can only visualize 2D and 3D, because that's just how our eyes and brains work, we, we're just doing simple things where the projection is very simple and it projects it into a quadratic space. Uh, we're using a quadratic kernel, okay, or a polynomial kernel, but it's just a quadratic kernel. And when you do quadratic things and intersections of quadratic things, you get circles, ellipses, and parabolas. I was saying, conic it, sections. Does, it doesn't seem like this method would help that much of that super clumped data space. So, like... no, but it does because All right, so we're look. going to oh, uh, we're okay. not going to use this polynomial kernel. Okay. We're going to use the Gaussian kernel, right. which again, 
I'm just saying projects it into infinite dimensional space. So don't even bother trying to picturing it in your head, okay? Because it. it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. Um, and so so here here it is. We are somehow projecting this into some mystery infinite dimensional space that we cannot visualize. But in this infinite dimensional space, there exists a linear hyperplane that will separate our red and our black. Yeah. What are those other dimensions? Like the third dimension was x squared plus y squared. Yeah. Uh, it it's I don't know what exactly what they are, but uh, if you think of the Taylor expansion for the e function, okay, okay. Uh, which is something. Okay, I don't remember. <laughs> You guys should have known, right? You guys should learn this somewhere, learn right? Somewhere. And it goes off to infinity. Uh, each component, each of those elements there, because the Taylor expansion is this plus this plus this yeah. plus this. It's each of those pieces okay. is one of those dimensions. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah, Bruce. No, no. Again, the point is, it's equivalent to projecting it and then drawing a linear boundary. Okay, it's equivalent to doing that. But it does not do that. Okay, it so does not do that. It automatically just like sorts it. No, it it's using a kernel function. Okay, and and I didn't do the math that says this is how we pick the maximum lar marginal classifier. Okay, I just said, you know, it's easy to visualize and and we're gonna, but I didn't do the math. But the, the but the math comes down to just seeing um, x multiplied by y. Okay, the vector x multiplied by the vector y. And it's enough to separate them. Okay, uh, if we replace that inner product of x times y with a kernel function, a kernel function, then you get it's equivalent to projecting it into the higher dimensional space because the kernel function itself is the inner product of a transformed x and a transformed y. So if I transform x into 3D and I transform y into 3D and I take the inner product, um, I'm getting, basically getting the inner product of x and y, but it's now transformed x and transformed y, and, and the kernel function returns a scalar and this and that, um, and I can use that to draw the, the boundary and, and it's equivalent to, to doing that. Okay, yeah, Yoni. Final question. I remember there's like infinite series expansion of the CLT theorem proof to are these no. somehow connected? I like, don't think you know, so. Don't think I, this so. maybe I don't know. Maybe. It's the infinite Taylor expansion. Okay, the ta infinite Taylor expansion is this infinitely long sum of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I and know. and and the when you project it into the higher dimensional space, each of those elements that you're being summed that are being summed up is the uh, each element of the the thing. But again, we don't have to worry about that. We just we yeah, just do it. Yeah, okay, sure. and. Uh, and let's, huh? It doesn't like my command here. I probably have to uh, load this data up. Okay, so we've got that. We're gonna run this. Okay, and then let's, okay. And so here, this is the result, okay? This is crazy, right? And we said there's no way we can do it. And this is the result that we get in, in one of these things. So this, this thick good. boundary is the, uh, the boundary that it, that it decided to draw. Now, um, this is with uh, using the radial basis function or the Gaussian kernel. Okay, When I said uh, here the kernel is radial. And then you have these two options, gamma and cost. So the cost, we said, is the kind of the penalty that gets applied for misclassifying a point. So watch just what happens. If I change this cost to uh, something really high, okay, um, it it really does its best to avoid misclassifying points, right? So it's it's uh, it's saying, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna create this little pocket here and this little pocket here and this little pocket here to avoid misclassifying any of these points. It it still wasn't hundred like we still got this red dot here and you know. It, it, but, but this is what we have, okay? So here, when I increase the cost of misclassifying a point, the, uh, the function says, um, I really don't want to misclassify. So, so if, I, if I do this with a cost one, we get this. And if I increase the cost, so here's uh, with cost 100, okay? 
um, we get a few of these things. And if I just bring in, like, increase the cost of misclassifying a point, oh, I might have broken it. You might have. OK, it tried. All right, we're going to see what, what it does. Uh, yeah, I, I think I broke it and didn't. it didn't quite do that great. It just gave up. OK, it, it, it really tries to avoid kind of these, these things, OK? So the other, the other thing that you can do is with the um, radial basis function, OK, there is, um, there is this thing called gamma, OK? And this gives the, the function um, more flexibility, OK? It says, um, so with a high gamma, it says, you know what? You can have really wiggly lines, OK? And if you have a small gamma, it's going to say, keep your lines nice and smooth, all right? So by default, the gamma starts off as 1, OK? So let me just kind of show you uh, what happens. So this is with gamma 1 and cost 1, OK? And then just watch what happens as I increase the gamma, OK? If I increase the gamma, it says, you know what? Um, go ahead and make your boundary wiggly, OK? It's OK if you have a wiggly boundary. And so here I put in gamma 5, and it says, OK, you can have, uh, you can have some wiggle and even have this little kind of um, enclave, exclave there. Okay? That is definitely nine. You can't do this and and, and uh, um, you know, And as I increase the gamma, so here I'll put it up to 15 here, it says you can even have uh, even a more wiggly boundary, right? OK. And, and we get stuff like this when we're getting kind of like these islands forming in the, uh, in the ocean of points, right? And so uh, it's, it's hard to know, well, what gamma should I use and what cost should I use, right? And this is, this is always uh, it's a hard question to answer. You can try to use cross-validation. Um, but again, if you have too high of a gamma, what's going to happen? You're going to overfit, right? If you have too high of a gamma and too high of a cost, you're going to be overfitting. Uh, and if you have too low, you'll have the other opposite problem. You're going to underfit. You're going to kind of have a boundary that's a little bit too simple, simplistic for the real world situation, right? And so here, uh, I can reduce the gamma. Instead of 1, um, I can bring it down to like 0.5. OK, here, let me just go back to gamma 1 cost 1, which is kind of the, the first thing. All right, and so if I bring down the gamma to uh, 0 0.5, OK, it just tries to get e an even more smooth thing. So here I'm going to reduce it to uh, 0.15, OK, and, and the it's getting even smoother until if I bring it to like 0 0.015, we're going to get something that's almost, almost a straight line, yeah? Okay? Where, you know, this kind of sucks, okay, as far as boundaries go. So, uh, so that's what we've got, all right? And so, you know, your homework, uh, I think I just say like, here's a bunch of plots and then comment on what gamma and cost do in this thing, OK? And again, we're, we're just kind of skipping all of the math that goes into how it figured out the uh, maximum. How long has my microphone been on? Uh, maximum margin classifier, OK? Uh, all right, is that all right as far as support vector machines go? OK. Uh, I hope no one's heartbroken about the math. I have my suspicions that you are not. OK. Um, oops. Uh, all right, we're going to go ahead and get into clustering, all right? I know, so much stuff. All right, so uh, we uh, take the simple no math version for SVM. I think that's fine. And then. Um, and so now we're no longer in uh, classification stuff. Okay.
Have you guys opened homework four? Have you looked at it? Have we tried it? Uh, I looked at it very briefly. Okay. And I concluded that uh, I don't know what I concluded yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we've covered everything to successfully complete homework for now. There's 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 three problems: the naive base classifier, the K and N, and the uh, support vector machine. The support vector machine is should be easy. You just kind of talk about what effect cost and gamma have. Um, and then the other two are really uh, coding exercises, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, um, ask, ask your questions up on Campus Wire. All right, so now we are moving into clustering, which falls under what we call unsupervised learning, okay? So everything... Uh, up until now, your neural networks, your classification stuff, um, and you know, in other classes you had, uh, or I guess we even did a little bit of linear regression and multiple linear regression. All of those things were supervised learning problems, okay? And uh, we had the answers that we were looking for. And so our training data, the way we did the training was we said, this is our predictors, and this is the answer that we should be getting. So create a model so that when I plug this in, I'm getting something very close to the answer that I know that I want. Okay? Here's my image, and I know that this is the number four. So when the neural network runs, figure out your weight matrices so that the output says it's the number four. Okay? Or Here's uh, an observation. I know that this is a Setosa iris plant. So create your model so that when I plug these four numbers in, it's going to say it's Setosa. Okay? And if it doesn't say Setosa, um, fix it so that it does. Okay? Or um, do it in such a way that the number of times I'm making a mistake is, is small. No, that's supervised learning because we have the answer. Right? We have answers to kind of supervise how we should be adjusting our weight matrices or adjusting our other things, parameters, and stuff like that. Okay, unsupervised learning is uh, a whole new class of problems. Here it just says, here's a bunch of data, and I don't know what the answers should be. There are no answers to be looking for, right? But Tell me something interesting about this data, okay? This is uh, uh, this is a, another uh, important thing because sometimes we don't know what it is that we're looking for, right? So, uh, so, um, so one of these things, one of the concepts in unsupervised learning is clustering. Clustering is the idea that. You've got a bunch of observations, and you want to group them together, okay? You want to say, these observations are similar, and these observations are similar, and these observations are similar, okay? And it's easy to do when you have two-dimensional data. You just kind of graph it, and you kind of just draw, like, circles and blobs and say, like, okay, these points are kind of together, and these points are kind of together, right? So that's, that's, like, a, that's like an easy thing to do. But... Um, you know, in higher dimensions, it's harder. And uh, and again, all of our stuff with clustering uh, is kind of the assumption that the input data is numeric, OK? Again, it's, it's really hard to cluster with categorical data, because categorical data already self-clusters, right? <laughs> if we say, uh, what's your gender, that already forms a couple of clusters, right? You're going to have a cluster of males and females and non-binary and uh, it's already going to cluster your data, okay? So the idea here is if we take a numeric response, can we cluster it, right? If we ask for your age, can we put you into two groups or multiple groups that are similar, right? And so, um, so we can ask your age, which we traditionally think of as a numeric response. You're going to say, I'm 22, I'm 21, I'm 30 whatever, 50 something. You know, you got this numeric response. And uh, advertisers cluster them, and they say, 
these are the ads we are targeting towards uh, 13 to 17 year olds okay these are the ads we are targeting to 18 to 24 these are the ads we are targeting to 25 <laughs> to 39 40 to 55 and 55 plus right so when you go on YouTube and you see ads shown to you that's because Google knows how old you are and is sending ads that are targeted to your age range right so that's why um, it seems creepy but you can tell right um, I don't know if you ever like like when you were in elementary school or high school or whatever and you stayed home because you were sick and you tried watching TV like there was like all the TV sucked right it was like oh my gosh everything on TV sucks and the advertisements were all about like um, medications right <laughs> and, and, and it's like it's because who watches TV during the school hours? It's not, it's not kids. It's uh, it's old people who need medications, right? And so the advertisers know this, and so they run the ads, appropriate ads, right? When you watch, when you're home on Saturday morning and you're watching cartoons and fun shows, that's when you get all the cool ads for like toys and things that you want, okay? And so, so this is uh, uh, because the advertisers have clustered the uh, consumer base based on age and we say all right these are the ads we're going to run for kids and these are the ads we're going to run for teens and stuff and so you know on instagram you get certain ads because they're they know how old you are right you might not have told them but they know all right and uh and they're running ads that are age appropriate and demographically appropriate and stuff like that right based also also based on what you've done online right you clicked a couple links and you ended up on this website and they're going to go, oh, we're going to now send you all of these ads based on that, right? And maybe it's listening on your conversations. I don't know what they're doing, right? But um, <laughs> I don't think that they're, they're listening in, right? But um, maybe. Um, maybe you accidentally said, I gave you permission for this stuff. Uh, but, um, but anyway, that is unsupervised learning. How do we know what ads to show you? Okay, they don't. There's no answer. Nobody said these are the ads I want to see okay there's no there's no target thing that says oh these are the ads that this person wants to see and let's make sure we get those ads to this person right nobody's taken a survey and says oh I want to see these kinds of ads no they're saying um, based on your activity and stuff they are trying to figure out what kind of ads are appropriate to show to you right if you click a certain website I remember like uh, I, you know, I was just browsing the internet. I ended up in, you know, it's a dangerous thing to do, right? Browsing the internet and ending up somewhere weird, right? And I remember after going on a certain website, I kept getting these like weird, creepy ads. And I'm like, oh, I know it's because I went to that one website. Um, and I was, you know, it was like, sign this petition for this thing. And I was like, I'm, I'm not into that, okay? <laughs> but, but they thought because I had visited this website that, you know, I had opinions where I would be more likely to sign this petition or something like that, right? Um, and so, uh, so stuff like that happens. That's all unsupervised learning based on data where we don't even know the answers. We're just trying to segment, create clusters and stuff like that. Okay, so um, we're going to do a very simple version of this where we just have like two-dimensional data and we, we make clusters. But, um, but conceptually, all you have to do is just scale it up to higher dimensions, right? Okay, so everything, all right, this is obvious, everything that I've said here, okay? Um, so the goal of clustering is to create groups of objects so that objects within a group are similar to each other and objects in different groups are different, right? Um, and so how do we define similarity, okay? That's, that's, that's a mystery, okay? Um, but for now, what's going to work is Euclidean distance. We're going to start off by using Euclidean distance, and that what, that's what K means clustering does. It says, um, you know, just graph this in, you know, regular old space, okay? And if we have two-dimensional data, just graph it on a plane. And then the way we're going to measure similarity is we're going to just measure the Euclidean distance from this point to this point, okay? And if they're close together, then that means these points are similar. And if they're far apart, if the distance is high, then that means they're dissimilar, okay? And that's what we do with k-means clustering. Um, the, uh, 
so that's that's what we've got. Okay. So the way it works, all right, the way it works is that we will take points that are assigned to a cluster and we find the center of the cluster, okay? Which is basically just the mean, the mean of those points. Okay, so whatever points are assigned to a cluster, we just take the mean of those points. Okay, and so the way we do this is uh, we're going to just do the sum of z times x. Z is a vector of labels. Uh, it's either a zero or a one. It's a one if it's in the cluster, and it's a zero if it's not. Okay, so basically, um, all the points that are in the cluster get multiplied by one, and so this thing on the numerator is the sum of all the points in the cluster. Does that make sense? And every point that's not in the cluster gets multiplied by zero, so they don't get added in. So the numerator here is the sum of all points in the cluster. We multiply z by our x, okay? So if, if x is in the point, if x is in the cluster, it gets multiplied by one, and this just ends up being the sum of the points in the cluster. Anything that's not in the cluster gets multiplied by zero, and so they're not included. And in the denominator, it's the sum of the z's. So it's going to be basically the number of points in the cluster. Okay? Yeah. And can't you just divide out the sum of z, or is that, am I lying? Uh, <clears throat> you, you cannot, you don't want to do that because uh, it's different for every x point. But z is always equal to 1 or 0, right? Yeah, but, it, but it's different, it, it's different for every, um, every point. Otherwise, yes. Conceptually, you're just adding up the x's for the points that belong to a certain cluster. Okay, and so algebra, you know, mathematically, it, it, we do it this way. Okay, if you don't, if you just cancel this out right away, okay, yeah. then um, then you just get the sum of uh, of all the x's, uh, and and that's gonna yeah, that's gonna right. be different. Okay, so so this is you're just basically adding up all the points that belong to a certain cluster. Okay, and and you're taking their average. Okay, uh, and then and so this is how the algorithm works, right? Um, and where we do the random assignment might might differ depending on whether you read this thing or something else. But but anyway, okay. So uh, first we say I'm going to look for k clusters. I'm going to look for two clusters or three clusters or five clusters. You have to define k, all right? That's a weakness of k-means algorithm is you have to know how many clusters to look for. And uh, and your answers will be different if you're looking for different numbers of clusters. Okay, and there's and the data itself, because it's unsupervised, doesn't tell you how many clusters there there should be, and how many clusters. I'll get into this more later. Okay, how many clusters? It's a it's a hard question, right? But anyway, you start off with saying I want to look for this many clusters. Okay, and then uh, your first step is to just randomly assign every point in your data. To a random cluster, okay. You're just gonna say you go to cluster A, you go to cluster B, you go to cluster C, and that's random, okay. So who ends up where is random. Once you have everybody assigned to a cluster, then using this formula back here, you're gonna find the centroid of each cluster. You're gonna say here's the centroid of cluster A, here's the centroid of cluster B, here's the centroid of cluster C, okay. And because of random assignment, the centroids will not all be identical. They're going to be slightly different. Okay. And so now once you have the centroids, you're going to reassign each value to a cluster based on which centroid is closest. Okay. So you're going to say, here's, here's a data point in our data set. And this is how far it's to centroid A. This is how far it's to centroid B. And this is how far it's to centroid C. Okay. So based on these three distances to the centroids, centroid A is the closest, so we're going to assign this point to centroid A, or cluster A. Here's a new point. This is the distance to centroid A, here's the distance to centroid B, here's the distance to centroid C. Okay, based on uh, the centroids, this point is closest to centroid C. Okay, so we're going to assign it to cluster C. And you do that for every single data point. Okay, once you have everything reassigned to a centroid, then you go back to step two and you recalculate all the centroids. You recalculate all the centroids. And then you reassign all the points based on the closest centroid. Then you go back, 
recalculate all the centroids, and then you reassign all the points to the closest centroid. Recalculate centroids, reassign. Recalculate, reassign. Recalculate, reassign. And you keep going until there's no changes. The centroids remain the same, and nobody gets reassigned. This assignments remain the same. And when that happens, you've reached convergence, and then your thing ends. Is that all right? OK, so visually, let's just take a look, all right? So here, um, I've got eight data points up on the screen. And I say, if, all right, so visually, if I said just cluster them, it's very easy, right? You'd say, these are here's a cluster down here, and here's a cluster up there, OK? It's really easy now. Um, but we'll follow the example, OK? We're going to say we're looking for two clusters, OK? We're going to look for two clusters. And so the first thing, I'm going to just randomly assign each data point randomly to cluster 1 or cluster 2, OK? So we're going to just randomly assign one of these things. So here I'm just going to do assignment as a factor, and I'm just sampling the values 1 or 2 with replacement. Okay. All right, and when I do that, OK, what do I get? Um, these are in the red cluster, and I get five points in the red cluster and three points in the black cluster. It doesn't even matter, OK? It doesn't matter. It's uneven. We've got two clusters, ran points randomly assigned to the clusters. OK. Now I say take each thing, and I calculate the centroids of the three black points, and I calculate the centroid of the five red points. So I look at this, and I calculate the centroid. And, and so um, here we have this, OK? And so just for centroid 1, OK, uh, um, I've got the points. For x1, I've got the points 0, 0, and 3, OK? So I add 0, 0, 3, and I divide by 3, right? And that will give me a 1. And then I do uh, for the same three points, which is this one, this one, 0, 1, and 3, I add those up and I get 1.33. I do the same for the five other points and I get 2.6 and 2.4. OK? Make sure you understand this slide, because you might have to do something similar in the future, all right? Manually by hand. OK. Um, so, we, so we do this. Yeah? Sorry, you said 0 for 0 plus 3 for cluster 1. Yeah. Where is that 3 from? So if we look at the assignments, uh, dot 1, dot 2, point 0.1, point 0.2, and point 0.5 are assigned to cluster 1, OK? So we've got this, this, and this one is 3, 3, OK? And so those three points are assigned to cluster 1, and so I take the mean of the points assigned to cluster 1 and the mean of the points assigned to cluster okay. cluster 1 for the mean of x1 and the mean of x2. Okay. So 0, 0, 3, and 0, 1, and 3, OK? So you think it's maybe on the final then? Yeah, you might, I think it's a might reasonable be. question to sounds ask. Good, right? Sounds good. OK, so uh, so I do this. I mean, you can use uh, dplyr to do it quickly for you as well. OK, and we get the same values. OK, so the, the centroid of cluster 1 is 1, 1, 1, 3, 3, and 2, 6, 2, 4. And so I've graphed the two centroids. So here's the centroid of the black cluster, cluster 1. And here's the centroid of the red cluster, cluster 2. OK, and now I go through every single data point, and we're going to measure how far it is to each centroid. OK, so we're going to, so this is a little overkill. I just got a little uh, graph happy here. So I say, OK, here's the data point. How far is it to this one, and how far is it to this one? OK, obviously it's closer to this centroid. So we're going to assign this to cluster 1, the black cluster. Okay, And I go through here. And I say, which one is closer? The black cluster is closer. So it gets assigned to black. We go to this one. Which one is closer? Closer, the black centroid is closer. It gets assigned to the black cluster. Same thing here. Which one's closer? The black centroid is closer. It gets assigned to the black cluster. Which one's closer for this data point up here? It's closer to the red, red centroid. So it gets assigned to the red cluster. Okay, And we go through, and these four data points get assigned to the red centroid. Okay, So all the assignments are done. And now we recalculate the centroids, okay, which gives me this and this. And then if I go through the same process and I say, all right, which points, which centroid is closer, these will remain, the, the, none of the assignments will change. Nothing will flip. And so we've reached convergence, OK? Is that right? OK, so here is. Um, 
a new data set. Um, I've created this from three multivariate Gaussians, okay? And this is what it looks like originally. We've got three different clusters. Um, but when we look at this, we don't know, and so we're going to just start off with random assignments, okay? We don't know which data point belongs to any of these clusters. And so I just randomly assign some points to black, red, and green. And then um, based on all of these points, I'm going to calculate the centroid of black and the centroid of red and the centroid of green. And um, uh, I did, you guys know how to use deplier to do this, right? Like you just do a group by and you say summarize. Okay. So, you know, 102A was a prereq. So, um, so group by and summarize, and you calculate the means of each of these centroids, right? Okay, or you do a, a T apply, okay? And so these are the three centroids that get calculated. Based on the current assignments of black, red, and green, these are the, these are the, uh, the um, centroids that get calculated. Okay, and so the next step is to reassign all of the points to the closest centroid, okay? So for everything over here, what is the closest centroid? Black, okay? And for everything over here, what's the closest centroid? Green. All right, and, uh, and so for the, okay, what about uh, this point right here, where my hand is right here? Is that, what, what will that get assigned to? Black, okay, and then what about this one? Red, right? And so we're going to get kind of a boundary between black and red somewhere in between here, okay? And then, um, and then we're also going to get kind of a boundary somewhere between like red and green, okay? And so we're going to get like a lot of green here, a lot of black over here, and then we're going to get just kind of a tiny sliver of red in between here and here. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so we're going to reassign all of the points based on which centroid is closest. And this is the result of that. Okay, and so now that I've reassigned all of the points to the closest centroid, I'm going to recalculate the centroids, okay? So I'm going to say, well, what is the center of all of these black points, okay? It's probably going to be somewhere around here. What's the center of all of these green points? It's going to probably be somewhere around here. What's the center of all of these red points? Probably like right around where it is. Maybe it'll move just ever so slightly, okay? So I recalculate the centroids. Okay, and this is what I get. And now I redo all of the assignments, okay? So everything over here will be black, everything over here will be green, and now red gets a little bit more, okay? We're gonna look at here, and then, so this point right here, well, this point will get, go to black, this point will probably still go to black, but then, yeah, maybe like this point will go to red, okay? And so we're gonna get some kind of boundaries halfway between black and red over here, and some kind of boundary where probably these points will get assigned to red and these points will get assigned to green. Okay, so you know again, kind of pay attention to what happens here and what happens here. We're going to see some of these points go to red and some of these points go to green. Okay, so we recalculate the assignments. Okay, so we reassign the points, and now now that we've reassigned the points, we recalculate the centroids. Okay, we say all right, here are all the points in black. Let's find out the center of the black. Here are all the points in green, let's find the center of green. Here are all the points in red, let's find the center of red. Okay? And we do that, and then we reassign the points, and we get, um, so just notice these, these, these will change, okay? And, uh, and these ones will also change, okay? So not as much changing, okay? And then we recalculate the centroids, and that shifts ever so slightly, and then we recalc reassign and, uh, and it looks like no changes were made, okay? So no changes. And this was the original, okay? And this is uh, what we, this is how we clustered it. This was the original data, okay? And so um, we might notice that there's just, um, so first of all, which one gets colored black, red, and green is irrelevant, okay? We've just assigned three clusters, and it doesn't matter that this is cluster one, and this is cluster two, and this is cluster three. This is what we call label switching. The labels don't actually matter. It just says, here are the three groups that we found, and it doesn't matter what you call group one, group two, group three. It's just important that you've, who got, you know, which, what groups exist, okay? Um, 
and we can see that you know uh, this data point, this data point in the original data, when we generated the data, actually came from this cluster over here. But when we uh, clustered it, it ended up in the center cluster, which makes sense because distance-wise, it's closer to the middle center. Yeah. Given that this is like a lot of other like iterative stuff, is there like a danger of local minima or whatever? Oh yeah, yeah. That's a that's a danger. Yeah. All right. Okay. And it's a it's a danger, especially if you don't know how many clusters to look for. Okay. So, um, okay. So anyway, uh, is this okay? The the process of how all of this went went and this iterative process of finding all of this. Okay. Uh, and then you know, this is the original. So this is even um, I risk misunderstanding by putting this slide in here. Okay. Because this is an unsupervised learning problem, so it's a little disingenuous to say that uh, these true clusters. Like when I generated the data, I did have true assignments, but again, it's unsupervised, so this data is these labels are never available to us. Like we don't know that these clusters truly exist. Okay. Um, so, um, so anyway, that's what we've got. Okay. Um, in your homework, the next homework assignment, you're going to write basically this algorithm that's going to do this, okay? And figure out the cl clusters. How many yeah. rows you run it until there's convergence, okay? So it's going to be different with every problem, okay? So in this one or the next one? Uh, the next homework. So this homework is classification, and the next homework is going to be the clustering homework, okay? Oh. All right. Um, so I'm going to make you write your own clustering thing just to make sure that you you know what's happening and all of that uh, in production settings though you're just going to use the k-means function which is created in R right so uh, um, so anyway this is what k-means and R does and uh, it's really easy. You just say k-means, I'm looking for, here's my data, I'm looking for three clusters. Boom, it's done, okay? Um, and then you can you can plot the resulting clusters. And it will tell you, you know, this is how we've clustered the data and all of that stuff, okay? There's um, there's the cluster in the centers and, and it measures all sorts of uh, information like your total sum of squares and the within sum of squares and, and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so just to kind of show you the results, this is what happens if you do k equals two clusters, okay? It's going to cluster the data, and this is the result. And we might go, okay, that makes sense for two clusters, okay? Um, here's what we get with four clusters, okay? We get um, green, red, um, blue, and black, all right? Uh, but again, you know, this is an iterative process, and so if I just have a different random starting spot, okay, with four clusters, this, this is where it reached stability and there were no more changes, but if somebody else had a different random starting spot, these are the four clusters it found here, okay? So in, in, in this case, when we did four clusters, it split this one into two things, okay? And this, again, reached stability, um, where there was reached convergence, where there was no, no more uh, reassignment, but we can see this result is different from this result, right? Like here, the this cluster got split into two, and here this cluster got split into two, and uh, <coughs> and so, you know, the there always remains this question of how many clusters are appropriate, and and you're going to run into this problem when you're using the wrong number of clusters, right? So if the, and, and this is a this is a hard thing, and maybe, maybe there should be four clusters or five or six clusters, um, or maybe it there's really only three clusters, or one cluster. Okay, this is this is a hard thing. Yeah. I mean, it seems like especially from this graph, the answer is just like, the three cluster had the most clear delineation between the three, whereas the yeah, four. Yeah, like, yeah. This is this is uh, this is a trivial toy example 
for us to just easily see these things, right? So, but if, imagine having data. So maybe you use SVM with this, is that the lead up? Uh, no, SVM again is a, is a supervised thing where you know uh, the answers and, and you know how it should be state, okay? Clustering is unsupervised and we don't know what the answer should be. We don't know how many clusters there should be. And if you're using quote the wrong number of clusters and again the wrong number of clusters is a weird word to say because there's no real answer okay now we might know the right number of clusters because I generated the data and I know how the data was generated but that's not going to be the case in real life um, and so you know my analogy is uh, like if you're gonna create a survey and you want to ask for race or ethnicity how many categories should there be? And this is a touchy subject, right? Um, so first of all, you can just say, well, okay, don't even bother. Just put everybody as human. Fine, okay, no, nothing's wrong with that, right? Um, uh, in the United States, you might see some forms where it's basically white or non-white, uh, person of color or something like that, okay? Okay, you might have uh, three, you know, white, black, and something else. You might have more, okay? Uh, white, African American, Asian, uh, Hispanic, Latin, Latino, Latinx, uh, blah, 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 blah. And, and you know, you can end up with a whole bunch, right? And then if you have Asian, that can get further split into uh, East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asian. Um, and if you have East Asian, that can get further split into, you know, Chinese and Japanese and Korean. And, and it just gets crazy, right? And what is the correct number of, quote, clusters to have? And, and it's, it's an impossible question. It's an impossible question to answer with any kind of definitive thing that says this is what we have. Um, and, and even in a, a simple data set like this, where we know the data was generated into three clusters from, from kind of three different um, mixtures, a mixture of three different components. When you look at the data, maybe you say, well, it makes sense to split this middle cluster into blue and green. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, right? Um, right now, uh, you know, as far as the advertisements go, it kind of clusters 18 to 24 year olds together but maybe that should be split between the you know 18 to 20 and 21 and over because you know maybe we can target alcohol related ads to you or something i don't know as if age was the only thing that kept people from drinking um i you know whatever right so uh how do we properly how many clusters this is this is hard um and so you know there are uh a, uh, a few things, a, a couple tools that can help us, right? And so um, here, what I've done is I've said, you know what, I'm going to explore, what do I have here? I've got a double loop, okay? A loop inside a loop. And so here, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna try going from K is one to 10. And for each of those Ks, I'm going to run 20 iterations, okay? So with k equals, say, 4, I will uh, run it once, and maybe I get this, and I run it again, and maybe I get this. And I'm going to run it basically 18 more times for a total of 20 times and just kind of see what kind of results I get. Okay? And, um, and one measure of kind of how good your results are is the uh, sum of squares within a cluster. Okay? So the sum of squares within a cluster is kind of a measure of how different your uh, data points are from each other, right? And so when you do uh, k-means clustering, you want the points within a cluster to be very similar, so you want a small within sum of squares, okay? Um, but of course, as you increase, add more clusters, you're always gonna get lower within sum of squares, right? The more groups you form, like the more, more things, right? So it's kind of just like how many more terms to add to your linear model, um, you're always going to get a little bit of improvement, right? So we're going to do this, and we get a whole bunch of results. So this is um, this is the within SS I got for one cluster, okay, which is exactly the same every single time. And for two clusters, I got like the same result every single time. 
when we look at something like nine clusters, we see we get slightly we get different but uh, similar but different results every time. Or, or I mean, sometimes we ended up with the same clustering, but other times it was also different, right? And that's because we're not getting the exact same answers with nine clusters or ten clusters. Okay. And so here, um, I've created box plots for each of these things. Okay. Um, and kind of the scaling just kind of ruins it. But, um, you know, this is a box plot showing that there's a little bit of variation with uh, 10 clusters, and, and this is what we have, right? And so what we see is dramatic reduction in a sum of squares when we go from 1 to 2 to 3 clusters. But then after 3 clusters, the amount of improvement we get in the sum of squares is, uh, is a lot more, is a lot smaller, okay? And so something like this would kind of indicate to us that three clusters is probably the appropriate number of clusters to use in this case. Um, and, and that just involved running the uh, k-means clustering, you know, multiple times for each selection of k. All right. All right, so does that kind of make sense? All right. Um, and so... So I think that's what that's what I've written there. Uh, okay, oh, two thirty-seven. Wait, let me just. I don't think I want to. I don't think I want to do this yet. Okay, we won't. Uh -huh. We won't. We won't. We'll, we'll save that for. Man. Wednesday of next week. You, you have huh? to have some way of drawing lines around yeah. it. It was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, so go back. How do you get SS clusters then? So yeah, if you use R's k-means function, okay, the result of the k-means function. Um, what if you did? What is has, SS clusters? So within yeah, the within SS is basically. So I'll just go back to this one. Okay, within SS is you know the distance from this point to its centroid, okay? So what, what is that? So uh, the centroid is 0.5, 0.5, okay? And so this has a distance of 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. So uh, 0.25 plus 0.25 is 0.5, okay? And we add up the uh, with it, um, sum of squares for all four points, so that will be two. And then we add it up for over here, and so we're gonna have a within SS of four. On, on this data set. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Let me um, let me test that out. <laughs> okay, so here is my uh, let's delete all of this. Okay, so here's what we have. And I'm gonna go ahead and just run k-means on x, and we're going to say we want two clusters, okay? Oops, and let's uh, call these results, and then let's um, do uh, results. Let's ask for the structure of results, okay? And we'll see total within SS. Oh, let's cut off over there. Total within SS is indeed four, okay? Because what it's doing is that it's found that the uh, centroid, okay, the centers are uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 3.5, 3.5, okay? Um, so let me just kind of show you the results. So if I do uh, results, dollar sign, centers, okay, it says the centers are 3.5, 3.5, and 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then thus the distance from 2, 2 to, um, again, going back to that slide, this distance is 0.5, and the vertical distance is 0.5. So each of these, the squared distance is you know 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared, which is also 0.5. So all four of these data points have a distance of point, square distance of 0.5, and all four of these have a square distance of 0.5. And so we have a total of four for the, um, total within sum of squares. Does that kind of make sense? Um, the total sum of squares, if you um, don't cluster it at all, is 40. So uh, because 
you're basically going to do um, the center of everything here is uh, 2 and 2. And so you do you know this squared plus this squared plus this squared plus this squared for all um, eight data points, and you get a distance of forty. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's that's what we have, and, and you can the ANOVA will split that between the within and the, the between. Okay. And uh, that forty breaks up into four and thirty six and things like that. Uh, the within sum of squares is technically two for this cluster and two for the other cluster. You can find out the within sum of squares for each cluster component, which is not necessarily the same. In this toy example, it is. But uh, for others, it, it might be different. OK. Um, so we will, uh, I guess we'll pause here. Um, I guess maybe just to kind of give you a taste of what, what's going to happen next week when we do the clustering with the kernel, kernelized clustering. It's going to project our two-dimensional data into a higher dimension and form clusters in that higher dimension. Okay. Um, all right. We'll uh, we'll end there. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the extra day off, and uh, we'll see you guys next Wednesday.